to send transcripts. I'm David. Welcome to the transcript. This week, Nacho Average Interview discusses the lunch door policy with Officer Wallace. Smarts and Crafts builds a gingerbread house with Superintendent John Provost. Hamped Up sits down with members of the girls' basketball team. And Sarah explains the 27 constitutional amendments on Paul ticked off. On Wednesday, a federal appeals court ruled that the Affordable Care Act's individual insurance mandate is unconstitutional, striking down the vital provision of Obamacare. The Fifth Court of Appeals ruled two to one that the ACA could not require people to have health insurance despite the individual mandate being upheld by the Supreme Court back in 2012. This change in verdict comes as a result of a tax cut by Congress this past year, which repealed the tax on individuals without health care. On Thursday, seven of the Democratic presidential candidates are debating in Los Angeles at the Loyola Marymount University. PBS NewsHour and Politico are the sponsors behind the debate, and PBS's Jody Woodruff, Amna Nawaz, and Yamachi Alcindor, along with Politico's Tim Alberto, will be moderating. Debate begins at 8 p.m. EST and is scheduled to last up to three hours. It will air on PBS and CNN and will be live streamed on Politico, CNN, and PBS. In Spain, a court ruled that Catalonian President Quim Torra was unfit to hold public office for the next 18 months after he refused to remove separatist symbols from public buildings during his campaign. The ruling will not come into effect until it is confirmed by Spain's Supreme Court, but it could trigger an early election in Catalan if it passes. The court ruling has set off a wave of angry protests in Barcelona and other Catalonian cities, and the yellow ribbon and other symbols of the Catalan separatist movement have become even more common throughout the Northeast region. I'm Jamie. And I'm John. New England Patriots beat the Bengals on this Sunday, 34-13. The Patriots broke a two-game losing streak by getting five turnovers, including four interceptions in the second half. Tom Brady threw two touchdowns, making a career record, if you include the postseason. The Bengals did score a touchdown, but then only managed a pair of field goals, which was not enough to compete with the Patriots. The Patriots' top-ranked defense was a winning factor, which all has been the case for the most season. Tune in Saturday when the Patriots take on Buffalo Bills. Have, Have a, a Merry Christmas, Christmas and a Happy New Year! On 
November 13th, the House Intelligence Committee began their first public hearings of the impeachment inquiry into President Donald Trump. Over the course of the next few weeks, important witnesses shared their accounts of the Trump administration's pressure campaign against Ukraine and the president's July 25th phone call with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. The public hearings began on November 13th with testimony from William Taylor, the United States ambassador to Ukraine. Taylor testified that one of his staff members, David Holmes, overheard European Union Ambassador Gordon Sondland having a phone conversation with President Trump, in which the two discussed, quote, the investigations, unquote, likely referring to the investigations President Trump requested that Ukraine open into Joe and Hunter Biden. When Holmes asked Sondland what President Trump thought about Ukraine, Sondland, a high-ranking official who was close to the president, allegedly responded that President Trump cares more about investigations into the Bidens than helping Ukraine. Next came Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman on November 19th. Vindman is a military officer who received a Purple Heart Medal after being wounded by a roadside bomb during his service in Iraq. He testified that he knew no one at the State Department, the Pentagon, or the National Security Council who thought it was a good idea to hold up the military aid to Ukraine. Vindman also said that he was concerned about the outsized influence of the president's personal lawyer, Rudolf Giuliani, on the U.S.'s Ukraine policy, since Giuliani holds no official government position. The highlight of the hearing, however, came when Vindman addressed his father, who immigrated from the Soviet Union when Vindman was a small child. Dad, I'm sitting here today in the U.S. Capitol talking to our elected professionals talking to our elected professionals is proof that you made the right decision 40 years ago to leave the Soviet Union and come here to the United States of America in search of a better life for our family. Do not worry. I will be fine for telling the truth. Finally, on November 19th, Gordon Sondland, the ambassador to the European Union and a figure who had loomed large throughout all of the public hearings, testified publicly. As the House Intelligence Committee and the American public learned more about the Trump administration's shadow foreign policy and pressure campaign against Ukraine, Sondland emerged as a key figure, working closely with Rudolf Giuliani and President Trump to get Ukraine to open investigations into the Bidens. Sondland's testimony may have been the most important in the entire inquiry, because in his opening statement, he explicitly confirmed the existence of an all-important quid pro quo. I know that members of this committee frequently frame these complicated issues in the form of a simple question. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. On December 13th, the House Judiciary Committee passed two articles of impeachment against President Trump, one for abuse of power and one for obstruction of Congress. The articles are likely to be approved by the full House of Representatives on Wednesday, and President Trump will become the third president in U.S. history to be impeached. Afterwards, the impeachment process will move to the U.S. Senate. I'm Elijah Bacall, reporting for The Transcript. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to episode four of Nacho Average Interview. I'm your host, Gabe, and this week I'm joined by... Eddie. And Wallace. <sighs> Well, why don't you just, why don't you just tell me about yourselves a little bit? He's a cop. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> he has a badge. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's, I've been working here for five years. Went in the police department for going on twelve. Been right. coming here for three years. Don't like it at all. Yeah, huh. three more. Yeah, cheers. You want to cheers it? Yeah. Cheers. Wait. You can bang it against the table. No, just eat it. Yeah. I got like a hunk of pepper in mine. I can see it on the knife. Yeah, it was a little chunky. So, <laughs> this week we're discussing the controversy of the lunch doors and them being alarmed, uh, or supposedly going to be alarmed. Mm -hmm. uh, what it comes down to is, do you think this is a reasonable way for the school to counteract students not returning from lunch? I think it's a reasonable way, but I think it's a dumb way. The whole kids leaving at lunch and coming back, the whole thing's missed that the state, and I just had a discussion earlier with this, the state says that when your parents bring you to school or you go to school, the school is responsible for your safety during the time that you're here. 
So, so what if we got a permission slip? Back, if you got a permission slip from your parents? Yeah, parent guardian. Say you're a freshman and you want to leave and your parents sign off saying it's okay for you to leave with your like, senior friend or something. Then is it okay? Like, or or See, if, if you were in that situation. No, that's a school rule. Yeah, yeah. At that point. Yeah, yeah. You I know, just don't like how we don't get, like, I, I wouldn't necessarily get, like, treated not so much like humans beings, like, during lunch, but, like, when I talk to any other of my friends at, like, different schools, it's nothing like our school. Yeah, a lot of them don't let people leave at all. No, yeah, but they're, <laughs> they're at least, like, walk around the school and not just be trapped in one little room. There. So the, the reason we, we had to start doing that, or this, the administration had to start doing that is because during, while you were at lunch, there are other classes going on, and what was happening is kids were getting their lunch and going to eat in other places and what they would do is they would walk past during their lunch period they were loud disruptive and you know you have your doors open when you're when you're teaching a lot of the times um, they were leaving food in stairwells throwing food in the bathrooms we were just having all kinds of problems cleaning up messes for the rest of the day well, people still throw food in the bathrooms i don't run into what you do i'm just talking about what other people do. <laughs> no, I'm, no awesome. I'm feeling it on the tongue awesome. you know. No, I didn't celebrate. Huh? All right, let's give her a nice little final dab. I know, dude. That's how it's feeling. You just gotta like put it down quick and just swallow as fast yep. as possible. Thank Mike. you for watching this episode of Nacho Average. I'm Officer Wallace. Catch you next time. Hi. Welcome, Welcome to, to Smarts and Crafts. Crafts. This week, we'll be sitting down with Superintendent Dr. Provost. And we will be making gingerbread houses. So have you ever made a gingerbread house before? I've made many gingerbread houses. Um, as part of an annual tradition, every Christmas Eve, my siblings and I and our families uh, engage in a very competitive round of uh, gingerbread house construction. So Dr. Provost, what do you like to do outside of your job? I'll say that the most satisfying part of my day most days is walking my dog. So have you always known you wanted to be a superintendent? Uh, no, that is definitely not the case. <laughs> I feel like if I had been a math teacher instead of an English teacher, I'd know how to arrange that chip. <laughs> Do you have any favorite events that the school puts on that you like to go to? I think my favorite, favorite events to attend are the football games. Um, especially early in the season before it gets too cold. I think it's kind of funny that students actually tweet at you. I didn't know that. Request a snow day. Do you have anything to say about that? It's completely ineffective. I'll just say that. I, um, it, it's, not a, it's not a vote. And, you know, I actually don't care how many tweets I get requesting a snow day. Um, however, it is nice to be engaged with students. I, I just don't want anyone thinking that my decision about whether or not to have a snow day will depend upon the quality of their tweets. This is John Provost, Superintendent of Schools, calling with an important weather-related announcement. All Northampton gingerbread schools will be closed today due to inclement weather. Thank you and have a good day. It was my pleasure to be here. I think we created a wonderful gingerbread house and I just want to wish everybody a very restful and safe break. I'll see you in 2020. Welcome, Hamda. Y'all ready for this? Rebecca Lobo, Lisa Leslie, Lauren Jackson, Candace Parker. Do these names sound familiar? 
They are the names of the most notable professional women's basketball players, yet they remain some of the least recognizable in the sports world. In an article published by the New York Times in 2016, it stated that year the WNBA received a sum of $25 million from ESPN, while the NBA revenued $930 million from ESPN that same year. We spoke with some of our own female basketball players to see if these disparities are presented in the school as they are on the national level. I think the fact that there's not a lot of recognition in the professional women's basketball does affect the fact that there's also less recognition for even just high school basketball. And you can really tell in the sense that guys games are so much more promoted and people use the excuse like guys games are more entertaining because they can dunk and like it's faster paced, but that doesn't necessarily mean that girls games aren't entertaining and you shouldn't be going to support them too, especially because we have won Western Mass in the past two years and we are most of the time winning our games. Even, in, even if the guys lost every game, people would still show up more, I feel like. You also see it on, even if they try and promote female basketball, like on Instagram, if you look, if ESPN or like Barstool Sports posts anything of like a female playing basketball or a female doing any kind of sport, all the comments are like, that's a funny kitchen. Like, that looks like a funny kitchen. Like, go make me a sandwich. We also wanted to know these ladies' predictions on their upcoming season. I think we have high hopes for the season, but we're still taking it one game at a time because we can't just because we won the past one Western Mass the past two years, we can't just expect to win it again with no putting in like putting in no work. So I think we definitely have high expectations and the season is going well so far, but mm -hmm. we can't be too cocky about anything. Boys basketball lost to Westfield on Monday, 64 to 47. Girls basketball won their game to Chicopee, 52 to 20. On Saturday, the boys hockey team also played Chicopee, but lost seven to three. On Wednesday, both boys and girls track won against Amherst and the wrestling team lost to Smith Folk on Saturday. Hello and welcome to Politic Off. Today we're talking about another really depressing subject because that's all we talk about now. Screw it, we're not talking about something depressing today. Hello and welcome to Politic Off, where today we are actually going over the 27 amendments to the Constitution. Okay, so we have three categories. Okay, these are things that probably just should have been there to begin with. Our next category is way too specific, which is when things are way too specific. And our final category is take backsies, which is when people actually realize they're wrong and amendment, a rare thing. To start off, we have the first three amendments, religious freedom, a right to bear arms, and soldiers can't live in your house. So all these fall either between in way too specific or somewhere between okay and way too specific. That was all for this week's episode. Make sure to check out further segments such as in other news on our website. Thanks for watching and have a great winter break. Yeah.